Welcome to World Shared Practices Forum. I'm Dr. Jeff Burns, Chief of Critical Care at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And with me today is uh, Dr. Robert Tasker, who is the Chair of Neurocritical Care at Boston Children's Hospital, Professor of Anesthesia and Neurology at Harvard Medical School. And he's going to be speaking to us today on traumatic brain injury. The goal of this forum is not simply to hear from an international expert on a topic common to us all and of concern to us all, but it's also to exchange knowledge around the world and to find out what you're doing out there. So through the presentation, we will be pausing to ask what your practice is at your center so that we can exchange knowledge and all learn together. Dr. Tasker. Thank you, Jeff. I think the first thing to say is that 2012 was a big year for our new understandings in traumatic brain injury. And I'd just like to take you to, to this first slide, which you will see has the website for the Brain Trauma Foundation. And on the left that you will see, uh, there are a number of um, guidelines that you can access. And fourth down, you will see that there is the Pediatric Severe Traumatic Brain Injury Guidelines. The new guidelines were a new iteration from the first edition, more publications, and what's listed on the slide, as you can see here, are the inclusion criteria and the exclusion criteria. And as you read the guidelines, it's very important that you understand why certain series of papers were included and why others were excluded. So we're only talking about papers that included more than 25 subjects, was in hospital care, the threshold of age was children under the age of 18 years, and that the pathology described in the paper was traumatic brain injury and not some other etiology. So Dr. Tasker, um, I know many of us are familiar with those guidelines and I think three common questions come up. The target partial pressure of carbon dioxide in your practice, um, the use of hypothermia, do you use it? If so, when do you initiate it and to what degree? Uh, and then last, there's some recent concern about uh, intracranial pressure monitoring. I wonder if you could comment on those. So let's uh, start with the target for PaCO2. And as you'll see in the slide, uh, I've summarized the whole of the guidelines in this slide in terms of the tiers of therapy. And the target CO2 comes relevant once you've initiated ICP monitoring. The adult guidelines and pediatric guidelines are summarized on this slide. And the evidence is at level 2 and level 3. And there's a difference that you should note. In adults, prophylactic hyperventilation of 25 millimeters of mercury is not recommended. And similarly, we should avoid prophylactic hyperventilation in pediatrics, but the li limit is set at 30 rather than 20, 25. Uh, however, you can consider hyperventilation as a temporizing measure if you're on the way to the operating room for someone to have an operation. Now, where do we get these numbers from? Uh, Probably the most important paper for pediatric intensivists is Peter Skippen's paper from 1997, as summarized on this slide. And uh, in the central panel, you can see that there are two segments. And I'd just like you to look at the upper segment. So these are 23 children who had isolated traumatic brain injury, Glasgow coma score less than eight, and these data were collected at a time when it was, it was when we would have ventilated patients to less than 25 millimeters of mercury for PaCO2. And what Peter Skippen's group did was that they took the opportunity to do Zen and CT scan for cerebral blood flow measurements uh, whilst this, these maneuvers were being done. And they also assessed whether or not there was cerebral hyperemia uh, during these CO2 changes. Now in the middle panel at the bottom, you can see a quantification of regional cerebral ischemia as defined by a blood flow 
less than 18 mils per 100 grams per minute. And then you can see that for each level of CO2, less than 25, 20, uh, 25 to 35, or greater than 35, there was also always some ischemia present. So setting a target of 30 millimeters of mercury does not exclude the possibility that the child has cerebral ischemia uh, that's ongoing. And if you want a dramatic uh, picture of that, look at the two, s two panels on your far left. This is the Zen and CT scan. The upper is without hyperventilation. Now you see it, now you don't. In the bottom panel, there's blood flow has been drastically diminished with hyperventilation. So th in my opinion, this was probably the one paper that changed our approach in terms of CO2 in this population. So what do we do uh, in our unit? Um, I can tell you what I would like to happen. But this is a picture of what actually happens. So what I've plotted here, this is a child who's had severe traumatic brain injury, has undergone ICP monitoring, and over 168 hours, we've plotted every value of end tidal CO2 in the red dots and every value of arterial CO2 in the blue dots. And as you can see, for most of the time, we're in the 30 to 40 range, but there are instances where we're below 30. Now, if you think that the target should be 40 millimeters of mercury, you can see that most of the time we're below 40. Um, and this, is, this, of course, is um, something that is ongoing, and we, we perhaps need better mechanisms for servo control. At the moment it's all done by hand uh, by uh, respiratory therapists who are changing the ventilation. So this may well be ongoing uh, insult to the brain that we're just not keeping ahead of. So in your practice and as you read the evidence, controlled ventilation with a PCO2 target around 40 and the avoidance of hyperventilation for the concern about ischemia induced from hyperventilation except in circumstances where there is a mass effect from herniation and a neurosurgical intervention may be possible, in which case you would recommend um, hyperventilation to a PCO2 target of low 30s? Um, low th inevitably what happens, I think, is that you end up below 30 when you're doing that, as, as you have someone herniating in front of you. Uh, there is, of course, new technology that may change all of this, and the ability to monitor and measure tissue organ perfusion and blood flow and oxygenation. Of course, CO2 is just a guide to what we think might be going on. If we could actually monitor what is going on in terms of oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption, that would change all of this. But at the moment, this is uh, the best that we've got in most settings around the world. So as we've heard, uh, Dr. Tasker's practice in Boston is to target a PCO2 of 40 TOR. And I wonder if we could pause now and ask you around the world what your practice is. Could you first identify what city your pediatric intensive care unit is in and then share with us what your target PCO2 is? And uh, let's, uh, let's round up some views from around the world and add any other questions you have for Dr. Tasker at this time. I wonder if we could turn now, Robert, to our second topic, hypothermia. What is the evidence on hypothermia and what is your practice in Boston as to when you instituted, how long, and uh, what degree target do you go for? Okay, thank you, Jeff. So going back to the schematic, the bottom row, far right, you can see this is where second tier therapies uh, come to play. And the summary of the guidelines on face value might seem confusing, but there are really two options. Essentially moderate hypothermia, 32 to 33 degrees Celsius, beginning early after severe TBI for only 24 hours duration, 
should be avoided. Moderate hypothermia 32 to 33 beginning within eight hours after severe TBI for up to 48 hours duration should be considered to reduce intracranial hypertension. And then if you actually do hypothermia, your rewarming rate has to be uh, below half a degree per hour. And then lastly, level C evidence is that moderate hypothermia beginning early after severe TBI for 48 hours may be considered. Now the reason why there seems to be uh, ambiguity there is really from the evidence. And if we look at the next slide, there are three pediatric studies on cooling. There's David Adelson's study from 2005, which was a pilot study in 75 uh, children with outcome measures at three and six months, which showed no effect. Then there was Jamie Hutchinson's study in 2008 with 225 children with outcome at 12 months, and there was definitely no effect, and some would argue that hypothermia was pretty close to having more unfavorable outcome. And then lastly, David Adelson's study that was planned to uh, have 340 patients but was stopped at 77 and was this study was presented at the World Congress in Sydney. Um, the outcome uh, was assessed at 12 months and there was no effect. As to what I do, given this uh, evidence that we've got of either showing no effect or potentially detrimental effect of hypothermia, in general our target is to target normothermia. And this is the data from the same child that I showed you before, but now on the bottom left panel there's uh, every measurement of uh, core temperature in this child. And as you can see, over the 168 hours, generally speaking, we're between 35 and 37 and a half degrees C. There's a period early on at around 24 hours where it's higher than we would have wanted, and certainly close to uh, the end of the admission, again, it rises higher than we would have wanted. So it's avoidance of hyperthermia and not inducing hypothermia. Th in the majority of patients, that's, that's what we do. Um, and does the uh, technique matter? Um, peripheral cooling versus core cooling? Um, and could you comment on your practice in Boston? So we're really... Uh, heating and cooling blankets. We're not at the stage of administering um, fl cold fluids intravenously or into the bladder or changing the temperature on the humidification. Um, and it's, uh, I think with those measures we can maintain patients normothermic. Um, if we were to move into the hypothermia therapy for traumatic brain injury. I think the questions arise, how quickly should we do it? How long should we do it? What should we do during rewarming? And as we've seen from uh, the evidence so far, it's unclear. And I'll return to this topic uh, at the end of uh, this discussion. Thank you. I wonder if we could pause now and ask our international uh, audience what your practice is. And once again, if you could identify first what city uh, your intensive care unit is located in, and then secondly, tell us in, patient, in a child with traumatic brain injury, do you use hypothermia? If so, uh, within how many hours of admission to the intensive care unit, for how long? Uh, and what is your target core temperature? And um, if, if possible, could you also address some of the rewarming concerns? Dr. Tasker, I wonder if we could move on to the third topic now, intracranial pressure monitoring. 
And as you know, in the last year, there's been some literature that has suggested and questioned the value of intracranial pressure monitoring devices in this population. Does this evidence, does this, do these uh, reports in the literature, do they uh, suggest that we shouldn't be using intracranial pressure monitoring devices in these children with traumatic brain injury? So everything that I've spoken about so far today has been predicated on the fact that we actually do ICP monitoring and that we're targeting PaCO2 or temperature with an ICP endpoint. If we look at the guidelines uh, that have appeared to date, this slide uh, summarizes both the adult and pediatric data. And in the upper row, retrospective observational studies, there have been five adult studies and one pediatric study looking at ICP monitoring and whether or not this improves our outcome. And lower ICP is associated with better outcomes. In the prospective studies, again, another six, five adult, one pediatric, and better outcomes in those with lower ICP. And now there is this new study that you alluded to, which was a randomized controlled trial in children and adults older than 13 years of age. And the protocol involved either an ICP-directed uh, therapy or imaging and examination-directed therapy. And the authors looked at a composite outcome of survival and function at six months post-injury. What the authors found was that there was more interventions in the ICP group compared with those that didn't have ICP monitoring. And uh, in the past, we, we know from pediatric studies that uh, from a Cochrane report that patients that have ICP monitoring in the context of head injury spend longer time on the ICU. So now let's look at these data a little more closely. Uh, the data were uh, published in late 2012 in the New England Journal. The number of patients in the study was 324. And as I've said, ICP monitoring, the target was to keep the pressure below 20 millimeters of mercury versus the other group that had an imaging and clinical examination directed protocol. The outcome in the two groups was the same, 39% versus 41%. Uh, by now there has been uh, a number of letters appearing in the New England Journal concerning this article. And what you see in the lower part of the slide is essentially my take uh, on uh, both the correspondence and the article. The first thing to point out is that uh, this study was done in six centers in Bolivia and Ecuador. Pre-hospital care in this population is, is worth noting. 45% of the patients were transported to the first hospital by ambulance. We don't know what happened to the other 55%. We don't know about interventions that were undertaken uh, pre-hospital. 44% of the population had one or both pupils unreactive. And you should compare that number or proportion with 25% in other uh, TBI studies that have been done in North America and Europe. 85% of this population had compressed or absent mesenchymic systems. And you should compare that with 22% in other studies done in North America and Europe. So pre-hospital, this, this was a, a particularly severe group, uh, more severe than we're used to seeing in either North America or Europe. Uh, patients were recruited within 48 hours, and half of them in both groups had neurosurgery. The key key point, though, is that overall outcome 
was close to 40%. And if you look at all other studies published in the New England Journal, uh, overall mortality has not exceeded 28%. So in the context of where this study was done, the pre-hospital setting, the severity of these patients, you could conclude that ICP monitoring served uh, no further benefit in the management of these patients over and above regular clinical examination uh, and CT scan. So in my view, in where I work, where mortality is 10 to 20 percent, I don't believe that it's been the issue has been tested as to whether or not ICP monitoring is beneficial. And to use these data from a setting where mortality is close to 40 percent, I actually think would be wrong to translate that to uh, a setting where mortality is less than 20 percent. So uh, at the moment uh, we engage in using ICP monitoring and these data do not inform us in terms of making us change but I know that many people are debating uh, these data. And I wonder if you could comment on the device that you prefer to use in Boston and, and the location of intracranial pressure monitoring that is preferred. Again there are differences in different centers. Uh, we use a combination of intraparenchymal devices or uh, ventricular access with external ventricular drain. Those are the two devices that we use. Very good, thank you. I wonder if we could turn to the international audience now and ask about your practice. And once again, if you could first identify what city you're writing from where your intensive care unit is located. And do you use an intracranial pressure monitoring device in children with traumatic brain injury? If you do not use an intracranial pressure monitoring device, do you use a serial imaging protocol where serial imaging is used to guide, guide management therapy? And we look forward to hearing from you on these issues. Dr. Tasker, thanks very much for this uh, wonderful presentation. I wonder if there's any final thoughts that you have you want to share with us? Yes, uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, there's one more element to the discussion which is now uh, becoming more relevant. And as you'll see on the final slide, um, it's to do with systems issues and our outcome in the system that we work in. And as you'll see from this slide, this is from the centers in the UK looking after children with severe traumatic brain injury. And on the middle section, or in the middle section, on the right-hand panel, you will see risk-adjusted mortality by number of cases per center over a five-year period. So the total population is close to 2,500 cases of severe TBI, all aged under 16 years. And the risk-adjusted uh, performance model uh, was the PIM model in this case. And as you can see, there is variation by center in regard to their risk-adjusted mortality from as low as 4% up to 20%. Now the obvious question is, why isn't performance the same by center? Is it because of volume? Uh, bigger centers having better volume, uh, having better outcomes, smaller centers having worse outcomes? Or is it something intrinsic to the local system, how they do things? And we talked about um, issues related to carbon dioxide, how we do hypothermia, whether or not we monitor and keep temperature at 35, 37. It may be that these small details make a difference by center. Or is it that some centers have a um, imaging, CT scan, and ICP protocol? Uh, we don't know. And these are all unknowns. And I think the future over the next five years will be 
uh, targeting, uh, trying to understand what happens between each center. And the Institute of Medicine has called this whole approach comparative effectiveness research, looking in a very detailed way and creating big databases of patients with similar conditions who are having different things done to them for the same condition and centers having different outcomes. Terrific. Um, well, thank you very much for this presentation and uh, we look forward to um, the questions that emerge from this uh, conversation and we also look forward to uh, your next presentation in World Shared Practices Forum. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Goodbye.